Davis, go to her body out tonight. As this team is getting ready. I encourage you, if you will, let's all stand together. Let's grab a hymn book and turn to page 438. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's sing together tonight. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away. You can probably tell we're having Bible school now, can't you, when you come in and see all the decorations. I know one thing we want to pray about is our Bible school coming up next week. Uh, there have been people in and out doing things in, in rooms, and we're thankful for, for them, all the work they put in. Um, what else besides Bible school can we pray about tonight? Anything you want to mention? I know last week... we. Okay, so the Fortenberry family, continue to pray for, for them. What's that? Okay, so we've got a few of those out for that. You know, sometimes we pray about things we don't remember to uh, to thank the Lord and 
But I know last week we prayed for rain. We've had some, so I'm thankful for that. Grass is not near as brown. So that's good. <laughs> that, that's the, that's the, the bad part about it when it rains, isn't it? Yep. Not to embarrass this fellow back here, but uh, this is Roy Black. He's come in tonight from Montgomery area. That's, uh, that's Jeff Halbrook, so he was remembering your dad. And uh, so he, his, his father was also Roy Black. He was a pastor in the 60s, so he's come up to check out the church. So uh, I know you, can, you might want to talk to him after about some things. So It's just a, a good time to, to think about the heritage of the church. Anything else? Any other prayer requests you want to mention tonight? Praise, perhaps? All right, well, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah tonight. Uh, and so uh, as, we, as we turn there, or, 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 before we do that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in, in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this evening. Lord, thankful for your blessings. Lord, you're so good to us. And we, want to, we do want to praise you for the, the rain that you've sent our way. We know those things are from you. You've seen fit to, to shower us, Lord, with your blessings and then lit literally with your, the blessing of rain. Lord, I thank you tonight for the, the children that are here. Thank you for Michelle. Thank you for all the teachers that are back there. I pray blessings on them. Thank you for the, the youth tonight who are here. Lord, I do want to lift up uh, Dalton and Micah, uh, the Beals, um, just all of them that are, that are gone tonight uh, serving and different ones are, are gone for different reasons. We pray you'd bless, bless them. And Lord, we do thank you for the work that they do around here. Father, we want to lift up the, the Fortenberry family. Pray you just bless them and their, their loss. Uh, some of them are having a, a really hard time. We just pray, God, you'd bless them. You, you are, as your, as your word says, the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies. And I pray that they would just come to you for that comfort that they need. Um, Lord, we want to pray for Melissa and pray for Bobby as he's showing symptoms and uh, others who are who have have. COVID or, or some other sickness, we ask God for your complete healing for them. And Lord, as we, we think about just the, the church in, in general, what you've done over the years, we just want to thank you for where you've brought us. And Lord, most of all, thank you for raising up faithful people um, over the years, uh, folks that many of us nowadays wouldn't even recognize names, uh, but they were faithful they served, they taught your word, they lived it out in front of people, they were, they were witnesses. And I pray that we would reflect on that, we would be the faithful of this generation, Lord, that you'd help us to do what it is you've called us to do, those things, the, the gifts that you've given us, that we would serve you with all of our hearts, that we'd be faithful in our families and in this community. And Lord, we'd just be a shining light as a, as a church. And Lord, we're, we're nothing without you. We, we, uh, we're just... Uh, we're just sinful people, Father, but we thank you that you, you use us. And I pray you, you'd use us and continue to use us, Lord. We pray tonight as we study your word that you would help us to have understanding of it. And then, Lord, I, I pray that you'd help us to apply it practically to our lives. We know it's not, not just written for history, and it's, it's not just telling us about those people at that time and what they went through, but they're lessons for us that we should, should gain from these words. And we just pray you'd help us to understand these things. Father, again, we, want, we do want to lift up Bible school, God, and we ask for, for lives to be changed, for salvations. I pray, Lord, that children might begin to come and their parents begin to come, and, Lord, that kids who are not going anywhere might, might be able to come to this place and hear about you and know that you love them and we love them, and you've got a wonderful plan for their lives that includes their salvation as they repent and give their hearts and lives to, to Jesus Christ. I pray that message will be so clear this coming up week. And I pray, Father, as I know, I know many are working very hard and next week's going to be difficult. I pray, Father, for rest. Um, I pray, Lord, you just multiply that, that rest. And I, I pray that we would just find, find joy and satisfaction in the, in the work that we do for your kingdom. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so Nehemiah tonight. Nehemiah, if you'll turn there. It's all right to look in the uh, look in the index if you're not sure. <laughs> That's one of those that you can might take you a little while to find. But you know, in uh, it's kind of an intro here in in Deuteronomy, God promised that if His people strayed from Him, 
uh, if they you know if they they didn't take his word seriously and they went after other gods that he would punish them uh, and and he he did or they did and he did you, you see beginning well really earlier than that but even in judges uh first and second samuel first and second kings first and second chronicles not to mention joshua they didn't do all that they should they began to stray even then those books chronicle the unfaithfulness of israel god was patient he didn't strike them right then there's there's long periods of of history but but eventually it came it came true and what god had promised if they strayed from him it it came to pass so what he did is he brought the assyrians and the babylonians to to bring off and and bring captive uh, the the northern kingdom israel and the southern kingdom judah uh he did that uh, the, the dates associated with that northern kingdom is 722 BC, and the southern kingdom they had a little more time, a little more grace. It was it was 586. Those are are the dates where they were just completely overrun there, and uh, they spent 70 years in captivity. You can read some about that in the book of of Daniel, but all this is all this is in that in that period of time. So during those years, you had the the Babylonians that were the, the Assyrians first. Then the Babylonians, they were strong. And then it was the, the Medes and the Persians. They had kind of an, an alliance. But, but a lot of people would just call this the, the Persian Empire. They're um, what would be today modern-day Iraq. And so you have the, the children of Israel that are, that are sent off to this place. They're, they're deported. Uh, some, they're the poorest in the land. They, some of them stay back. Uh, but... But most of the well-to-do and most of the people, people like, like Daniel who could really benefit those kingdoms, they, they, were, they were taken off. So you have Assyria and Babylon and then the, the Persians. Um, so just to, I don't want to give you too much tonight, but just to, to keep those things in mind. So uh, Ezra begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, that they ought to go back and build the temple. Uh, he's, he's partial to uh, the nation uh, and he, he wants them to do that. Um, another thing about this is that was about 539. Uh, you remember the story of, of Esther. Esther's the, the queen, and she's brought in from, from all these, these women. She's chosen to be queen. She didn't really want that. But remember, uh, she was told by her, I guess, adopted father, uh, who knows but that God has placed you here for such a time as this. Her husband, uh, the king, was named uh, Xerxes. It's... Uh, it's uh, X E R X E S, and there's a his his son. The scholars disagree on whether it's the son of uh, of Esther or maybe Esther's his stepmother. But whatever it is, that son is named Artaxerxes. And when you read in Nehemiah, the uh, in in chapter two, the the king that was there that allows Nehemiah to go and rebuild this wall, that's Artaxerxes. So. I don't know if you followed all that. I don't know if it's very clear or not. But just think about what God did to bring that to pass. It's amazing the the way He does things uh, in our in our lives. Um, so Nehemiah is the account of the the third wave of the children of Israel back there to their homeland. There was there was a, a small one, and then there's uh, there's Ezra's, and then there's there's Nehemiah's, and that will be when many of them come back for good. So that's a little bit of the background. The the history of it and, and with that let's pick up and look at verses 1, 2, and 3 of Nehemiah chapter 1 so it says the words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the citadel that Hanani one of my brethren came with men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem and they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned uh, with fire. So it's been about 13 years since this second wave, since Ezra came in. And, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have TV back then. They didn't have the Internet. You can just Google what was going on. And so uh, Nehemiah, who... who Scholars say he, he probably had never been to the land before before then. But he's he's heard from his people this this beautiful land that God gave us, and we're going to go back there one day. He's hearing all this, and so 
uh, Israel and and the, the Lord God of Israel is in his heart. So here he is, and he's in a high position. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, this guy, Hanani, he comes back, and he, he tells Nehemiah what's going on in, in Judah. So he's, Nehemiah's in Persia. This other guy's just been in Judah, and he, he's coming back, and he's telling Nehemiah, whose heart is in that place that he's never been, he's telling him how things are going. Was it good news or was it bad news? It was bad news, right? Things are, things are not, not going well. And part of the reason why it's, it's such bad news is uh, it's, it's not just that the temple is vulnerable. Remember, Ezra went back and he, he had a, hand, a big hand in rebuilding the temple. The walls are now broken down that protect the city. Um, so it's, it's not just that the temple is vulnerable. It's, it's more than that. Uh, here, God has promised punishment. He's been so gracious for so many years. But finally it comes to pass, and he says, it's enough. There's no more chances. You, you, you've run out of, of chances. And he sends the, the Assyrians. He sends the Babylonians. And now they're finally getting back in the land after uh, a few decades, uh, and they're not, they're not following God. They're, they've become a reproach. God's not blessing, and the reason for that is that they're, they're not following him. Uh, so all, all this he goes through, Nehemiah hears this. He's just, he's just brokenhearted. He wants to see his people follow God. He wants them to be back in the land. Um, I think there's a parallel here to, to, here to our country. Um, do you feel like that our country is following the Lord? You know, I think we'd, have a, we'd be hard-pressed to, to say that. I remember the first time I heard somebody say that America is a post-Christian nation. Uh, this was years ago, and I thought, how can somebody say that, you know? But then, further I get, I, I kind of feel like we're, we're there. We are sort of past that. We're not. It'd be hard for us to say we're a Christian nation anymore when, with the majority of people, or, or at, least a, a, at least close to that, believing what they do, not following God. Laws go into this or that, although we've had a, a recent ruling that has, I think, been, been honoring to, to God. But, but anyway, I think you know all that. Um, so how do you feel when you think about your country, especially those of you who are maybe a little older than, than me, and you've seen, you've seen the country in a lot of ways follow the Lord, you've seen what it was, and now to see what it is now. How does that make you feel? It is a sense of sadness there. The think about the founding. Um, I saw an interview with uh, a World War II vet. Not many of those guys left. Y'all may have seen the same thing, but he just choked up as he talked about all his friends that were that were lost in, in battle and that kind of thing. And then, you know, they they were they were proud to to do that and happy to to do that. But then to see what it's become has really broken his heart, obviously, because he's like that. This is not what we fought for, you know. And there's there's different opinions about that. I know, but. So thinking about those things, you can get the sense of what Nehemiah is, is thinking and feeling uh, as, as he gets this news from Hanani. So before we go to the next section, is there anything anybody would like to add to that, I'd like to say about verses one, uh, 1 through 3? You're exactly right. Yeah, used to we could call ourselves that. Uh, you know, there's, I, I can remember people talking about a silent majority. Yeah, I'm not sure it's that anymore. Um, so, but I think, yeah, a remnant is closer to what we're what we're getting a um, lot of lot of believers we're blessed especially in this area a whole lot of believers still but there's come it's my coming a day when it's getting it's getting worse and worse um, so he hears this and the feeling that that you guys have thinking about our country that's the feeling he has in, in you know whatever degree it's in but he that's that's kind of gives you an idea of what he's feeling and so let's look at verse four pick up here we'll read down through uh, verse uh, 11 the end of the chapter it says so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven I said I pray Lord God of heaven O great and awesome God you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, 
day and night for the children of Israel your servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out of the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant, servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Um, so, wow, what a prayer, right? It's, a, it's an amazing prayer of, of faith and trust and just really seeing God for who he is. He's, it's like he's got that vision of God right there before him, but... Um, what about you? What do you think about some lessons that we can learn from Nehemiah's prayer here? Anything you can see from this prayer that, that really sticks out to you that, that um, I don't know, that speaks to you? Or maybe you think, well, I don't, I don't pray that way. I need to implement that in my prayer or, or something like that. Anything um, strike you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We definitely need to be praying for our nation. Sometimes we... Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So, but we need to be faithful to do that. That's a great point. Anyone else? You know, in, in verse 4, the, the first thing he does, he hears this news, and then he was fasting and praying and mourning and weeping, all these things. But he's, he's talking to God here because he knows that he is almighty and he is sovereign. Um, just honestly, his, his prayer always your first response to something that happens in your life um, something something small or something big sometimes we have a major catastrophe you know or we have a job change or we have you know should I marry this person these, these kind of big decisions and we get God in on that right we get we get him involved in that thing but if it's just a small thing we're just going throughout our daily lives we might we might go a while without without praying without talking to God and Honestly, sometimes my first response is not to pray, to get down on my knees and on my face before the Lord and pray. But sometimes my tendency is to say, you know, I, I can fix that. <laughs> I can do that. I got the answer here. But Nehemiah prayed to the Lord, and the Lord gave him the answer. So I think for us, we need to be reminded that prayer is always our first response. and We should, we should go to Him first. Uh, when I look at verses 5 and 6, just thinking about what he says, O great and awesome God, God of heaven, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. I think about him seeing God for who he is. He is a faithful God, a loving God, a covenant-keeping God. He goes on and, and he reminds God, not that he needs reminding. I think more than anything, Nehemiah needed to remind himself what God said. Uh, Lord, if... You said in your word, uh, that's not a name it and claim it thing, but Lord, you said in your word that that you would scatter us, and that's what you've done. We've seen that. I'm I'm right in the middle of it. But if if we return with our hearts, you'll bring us back. And God, here I am. I'm I'm praying that you will bring this about, and you will turn the hearts of your people to you. I, I love that. Um, I think a lot of prayers that we pray are kind of flippant. You know, not not a lot there, but you don't see. You don't see anything like that. He's, he's just on his knees. He's begging God, you know. The Lord's before him. He's humble. He's just begging God to, to do something. And I think it, it sort of informs our prayers. I think sometimes we can pray um, selfishly sometimes. You know, you get involved in your prayer life and you look back and 85, 90% is just me. It's, but he really doesn't pray much for himself here in this prayer. He prays for his country, like Miss Lisa said. And he prays for the people in the, in the nation. He prays that God would be, be honored and his word would be followed and those kind of things. So I think it's a, um, it's a, a, a good thing. And in verses 7 through 9, he talks about returning and that I've been unfaithful. My father's household has been unfaithful. He doesn't pray 
without first obeying, you know. I think a lot of times that might be why we don't pray because we, we're not really necessarily wanting to obey. We're not wanting to do anything different in our lives. We don't want to turn away from this sin and follow Him. And so we think, well, this is the way I'm living, so I might as well not pray. And I think you might, you might have a point there if you say that. But Nehemiah knows that, that there's not really any point in praying if he's not willing to obey the Lord and turn to Him with all of his heart. But that's what he does. He says, I, I've sinned. My father's house of sin, we, we've all done that. And he's, he's, he's repenting there, and he's getting things right. He's obeying before he's praying, and I think that's important. Um, and so in, in verses 10 and 11, it, it kind of leads into grant mercy in the sight of this man. He's talking about the king, and you, you, get, you get sort of an idea of what's about to come. But notice, he doesn't take any action without praying. Uh, he doesn't go and, and do that. Um, and so I feel like for, for me and for all of us, I need to learn dependence on God like, like this. I think we can all learn from this prayer. So before we move on, what, what, else, um, what else do you have to say about, about this section? Anything? Mm-hmm. That's right, yeah. Yeah. You're right, yeah, it says he wept and mourned for many days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Um, one other thing, too, it talked about night and day. I mean, he was, he was just constantly in prayer. Sometimes we pray, we pray, you know, like for one day, and we might pray for the next, and then we just give up. Well, I guess he's not going to answer that prayer. But he's, he's praying for a long time here. We'll see this in a minute, just how long he prays. But it says he's the king's cupbearer. Any idea what a cupbearer is? Somebody just goes around and carries the carries the cup, you know. But what what does a cupbearer do? Do you know what he does? Yeah, definitely. It definitely he's and some of them were more advisors, and I get the idea that Nehemiah was, but at the very least they're trusted. They're they are kind of like a right hand man. For a, a cupbearer, they're Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> Listen, yeah, that's their main job. So uh, they would they would taste uh, the the food and the and the drink. You know, they're called the cup bearer. It's primarily the drink. You'd have a a liquid poison that would be more popular. Uh, so th- th- you think about a cup bearer. If uh, so if you had somebody like that and you you were afraid you were going to be poisoned, you know, and it was a real fear, would you want somebody that you trusted or somebody that you wasn't so sure about? That's a, yeah, I know you know the answer to that. It, you, you want somebody that you trusted, right? And, you, and so over time, the king, he might go to a foreign land and meet with another king. And, you know, his cupbearer's there, and, and he, go, he goes with him because he's tasting all this stuff. He's making sure that he doesn't, he doesn't get killed. And he's going everywhere with him for, you know, he's eating meals with him, and he's together with him. And that's what a cupbearer does. He becomes a right-hand man. He becomes a friend even at times, a trusted ad- advisor. Now, they're not on an equal playing field. He's still his, his servant, but there's that, uh, that, I guess, that sense of which you work so close with somebody, you get their ear, they know who you are, they, they trust you, obviously, you're in that position. He trusted him with his life. And so I think about God, again, setting things up. You think back to Esther. That just blows me away, you know, that, that, that this, this guy, this king, who Nehemiah is his cupbearer, that's Esther's, either son or stepson probably a step, it's probably her stepson so God's working in behind the scenes he's doing things here uh, that's one of the reasons that the book of Esther is read uh, every time they'd have the they call the feast of Purim they would read that uh, just just because hey God you're right here with us and you, you brought us back this is this is your doing and we could only see it as that but have you seen God do that in other um, people's lives I guess in in scripture where where he put them in a in a special place just where he wanted them to do a certain thing have you can you think of anybody like that in the scripture I mentioned Esther is there anybody else that you can think of God had his hand on me put them in this position just to to have influence over a certain thing yeah absolutely Moses yeah he, he was in the uh, in the um, Egyptian Pharaoh's House and God gave him that education and, and he knew people and that, that kind of thing and he was 
he was just right for that job, although he didn't think it. Somebody else? Joseph's a, a great one. You know, he, he gets, again, sent to Egypt. He's in that position where he's second in command, and he, he allows the, the, the young, fledgling nation, basically just Jacob's kids, to, uh, to survive. And we know who's part of that. Judah is part of that, who would become the, the great, 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 and so on, grandfather of Jesus Christ. He kept that alive. God had that. Anything else? Daniel's great. Daniel's a, a good one, yeah. He put him in that position, absolutely. Uh, one other that you might not think would be uh, the Apostle John, you know. John uh, apparently knew some in the royal family. He was able to be close there and wasn't under suspicion because of, of, of who, uh, who he, he knew. So, so what about you? We, we know about, you know, Daniel. We know about Esther and Joseph. But what about you? God's put you in a certain position, right? Now, it, may, it may not be that presidents and kings, you don't, you don't have their ear. I get that. But it may be that for, for some, and we do have some even in our church who um, ha, are in a, a position, you know, to influence city and county leaders, uh, influence laws and things that happen uh, in, in our little area. Um, there's, a, there's a certain amount of influence that, that you have in, in your job. Some of you have a job maybe that you meet a lot of people. A lot of people come through. A lot of people see you and you get a chance to, to see them and speak to them, build relationships and that kind of thing. And, and all of us have some kind of impact from our position, from, from where, where we are. You know, you may think of yourself as unimportant. Well, I just, I just work here. You know, that's all I do. I work here and then I come to church and that's, that's pretty much my life, you know. But you have a bigger influence than you, than you know. Um, you know, I think about, not to embarrass anybody at the funeral home, got several that work there, so, uh, but young, young man came and started working there and, and didn't really believe in God, got around some of these folks and uh, several weeks ago he gave his life to Jesus Christ, got baptized and you know, so every workplace, you know, I'm, I see, well, I just see the same guys. I see the same people. Well, you have a great impact on their family life, how they raise their children. Um, and I think sometimes we don't really realize that, but God's put you exactly where you are, and you have, you have influence. Just as much as he placed Daniel and, you know, Nehemiah and whoever, he's placed you right where you are. So think about that when you get up and go to work uh, tomorrow. You've got a great influence. All right, anything else before we move on to, to chapter 2? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. God had him, had him there just for that. He was faithful. That's right, you can go on to lots of different ones. <laughs> well, let's look at verses 1 through 6 then in chapter 2. It says, Now it came to pass in the month of it looks like Nisan. It'll be okay if I say it like that. Nisan, probably. Um, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took wine and gave it to the king. Now, I'd never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Uh, so, uh, verse 5, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to him, or I'm sorry, said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me uh, and I, I set him a time. Um, now, you see in verse 1 of chapter 1, it came to pass in the month of Chislev. And then now you have um, another time reference in, in the second chapter, verse 1, the month of Nisan or Nisan, however you say that. Now, I'm, I'm not, uh, I know January, February, March, April. I don't, I don't know the others, but I'm told that this is four months later. And so he waits, he gets this news, and he doesn't immediately start about planning stuff. I mean, he's, he's praying this whole time. That's what he's doing. He's, he's laying the found, foundation and the groundwork by praying. But, but it's, it's four months later, 
when finally he gets an opportunity. Um, and he waits until the king opens the door. And the king I'm talking about is not Artaxerxes. I'm talking about the king. So God opened the door for him. Uh, and, you know, I take, I take this, and you've probably seen this in your life. You're in this position. You've got people that you know don't know the Lord. Um, oftentimes, we don't really have to force things. Uh, and Nehemiah didn't. He prayed, and it, he just he waited for the Lord to open a door. And he wasn't thinking about this. He he had made a conscious effort to you know to keep up. I guess I guess if you were too sad in front of him, he'd probably chop off your head. That's probably what would happen. So that's why he was really afraid. But you know, it'd been four months, and finally he was he just he let his sadness get the better of him. It caught him off guard, and the king the king noticed him, and he said, "Hey, why are you sad, dude?" Uh, you're not sick. You've just got sorrow of heart here. That's what's wrong with you. You're, you're heart sick. You're heartbroken. Tell me what's going on. Why are you this way? And Nehemiah's like, oh, man. But this is from the Lord. The Lord opened an opportunity. Nehemiah was waiting and looking, I, I think, for an open door. And I think that's really all the Lord asks of us. I don't know that he asks us to bust down every door, you know. But he wants us to be praying and be faithful and be watching. You've got coworkers that, that don't know the Lord. You know, do you have to go your first day and, you know, just uh, put the Bible right in front of their face and, and say, hey, you need to read this and, and that kind of thing? I think what you, the best approach to that is you befriend people and you start to lay the groundwork and they, they see your, your life. And it doesn't, it doesn't take long for them to notice that your life is different and, you know, you just, just wait a little bit, you know week two weeks sometimes it takes maybe a month but it won't take long before somebody will ask you they'll notice something that you do or that you don't do and then they'll say hey man why did what is going on why don't you drink like we do why don't you go to this place how come you don't go there you come home to your family every night instead of going like we do down here and and it'll naturally come about so i think that the thing to do is to get your heart right pray be looking for those doors be waiting for him to open the door and when he does we can, just, we can just go right through them. You don't have to bust them down. You just wait for the Lord to give you. You've seen this in your life, right? Where you were, you praying for somebody to be saved, maybe. Praying for an opportunity to share with somebody. And all of a sudden, you're just doing your work. And then you hear that voice. They ask you a question. You're like, well, that's it. Here it is. And God opened the door. And, and from there, it went. If we're walking by the Spirit, we'll know, we'll know those things. Um, and now, verses 7 through 8. Let's, let's read those. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Now, you can tell Nehemiah, he's been thinking about this thing, right? <laughs> he's taking those four months, and he's, he's saying, you know what, I, I bet I'm going to need this. You know, I'm going to need a letter to this guy, and boy, it's going to take a lot of wood. So it'd be good if the king would write, write me a letter, give me all the, the wood that we're going to need to rebuild this, this wall. So he's been thinking about this thing, and he's ready when that opportunity comes in, in four months. Um, so things just worked out perfectly for Nehemiah. And what was the reason that that happened why, why did things work out perfectly for Nehemiah kind of mentions it at the end of that last verse that I read that's right he says the good hand of God was upon me and Nehemiah you know he's sort of opening the curtain and we can see behind the scenes there's a, there's a director you know and he's, he's telling this one to do that and here he's softening up Artaxerxes' heart and he's waiting for the, just the right scene. And here it is four months later. And God says, the lights go, go low. And, and he's just directing everything. And you ought to see your life is that way too. God, you're directing this. I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be ready. And I'm going to be faithful. And I'm going to obey. And I'm going to walk through that door. But I'm not going to be worried about it because you're in charge. And I think that's a good way to live. So over the next few chapters here, we're not going to read all these. Just to, We'll read a couple of them. But... Um, Nehemiah, he, he goes, and then he oversees the, the rebuilding of the walls. 
despite a lot of obstacles. There's a bunch of obstacles that, that take place. Um, you, you can go back and, and read about some of those. He's got some, some enemies that try to, uh, try to hurt him, try to hurt his reputation, try to just lob some different things at him, try to distract him, and he says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be distracted by that. I've got, a, I've got a great work. I'm not coming down. That's a famous part of, of Nehemiah. But it's a great story with lots of lessons of, of courage and perseverance and wisdom and faithfulness. All these things are, are here. Let's skip ahead a little bit to chapter 6. So once they start, they really get moving, you know, and they, they assign different different families, different parts of the wall, and it's really incredible how it all comes together. Um, and so verse 15 in chapter 6, it says, So the, the wall was finished on the 20th day of Elul. And you're like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, and they perceived that this work was done by our God. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. You know, they, they finished it in 52 days. Um, you know, the work crews around here, how long have they been working on that bridge over there out east? You know, <laughs> it's just a little thing. And they got a whole wall around the whole city, and they did it because their, the Lord was with them, and their hearts were in it, you know. <laughs> and they finished it in, you know, in 52 days. That's, not, that's just uh, not even eight weeks. That's like seven weeks in a, in a couple of days. That's, that's awesome. So they did that. And then I, I love the way it says that here. The enemies heard of it. You know, they didn't think we could do it. It's going to, it's going to take y'all a year to do that. Y'all never going to get that done. And they do, it in, they do it in eight weeks. They get it done. And it's all shiny and it looks good. Uh, and then the, the nations around it, they were, all these people were watching, you know. They were sending in spies and they were watching. And when they saw how now they got the, the temples, you know, good and, and then now the walls there, they're like, that can't be anything but God. God was in it, and uh, I love how God was just exalted in that. He was lifted up and, and exalted in, in what they did. He was exalted in everybody's eyes. Um, so let's, there's a uh, a lot of uh, not, they're they're not genealogies, but they're they're lists of families that that come back to Jerusalem. These things are written down, and they would be some of these lists would be would be vital when you're talking about returning to the land uh, later on. So. If you flip there, you can see all the all the names that, that are there. But look at look at chapter eight, and we'll finish with with this and part of of chapter nine. So I'll just read a I'll read a fair amount of this, and we'll end with it. It says, "Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra to scri- the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel." All right, so before we, before we go on, I just want you to think about the scene here. You've got a whole bunch of people. It's a celebration day, and they're, they're standing, you know, and, and here's, what's, here's what's happening. It just blows my mind the hunger that they have for the Word. So it says, verse 2, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So here he is. He gets up there. I don't know what time morning to midday is, but let's say it's eight to twelve. Uh, how would you feel about that if we said, "All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna go out there and we're gonna we're gonna get on our trailer like we do sometimes, you know, during the during the COVID, and uh, somebody's gonna stand up there and they're gonna read the Bible to you for four hours. How would you feel about that?" <laughs> but they were hungry for it. They were ready to hear it. Verse 4 says, So Ezra the scribe stood on the platform of wood, which they had made for, for the purpose. Beside him at his right hand stood a whole bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> and in his left hand, a few more people. Is that okay if I just... Y'all, y'all just scan those. I'm going to mess those up so bad. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. 
And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Can't you just see it? There are times when, man, they just praise the Lord as they're reading. They're, they're just praising Him. Other times, they hear about some of the ways that they have dishonored God. And they just, you know, nobody's telling them to do this necessarily. They just, they just spontaneously get down on their face before God. You just imagine what that is like. Also, all right, I'll try it. Jeshua. Uh, no, I'm not going to try it. That's too many. So there's a bunch of people. <laughs> Help the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And I love that too. He's, here he's reading and some of the people, maybe they're young. You know, maybe they just don't understand. Maybe they've lost something of the language. And they've got people coming around, around them and saying, Hey, this, when he said that, that's what he means. They're giving the sense. And they're really wanting to understand this. Uh, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Uh, the, the words had been not read in a long time. Uh, this happened before. You remember there was a time where the words of the law were completely lost, and they had to find it in like the ruins of the temple. Uh, but they, they did. That was Josiah. And here, here's a, it's a, a similar thing. The people weren't following God. If there were copies available, there weren't, there weren't many. It wasn't like in our day when you've got, you got three Bibles at home on the shelf and you've got one in your office, you've got, you got one in your car, and you've know, and you got one that's just your church Bible. You know, that's, that's the good Bible. Yeah, that's your church Bible. Uh, it, it's, it's not like that here. And they, they hear these words, and they, they really don't know what God has said. But now they hear all of these things. And, God, I hadn't been faithful. I've been, I've been doing this, and your word says, if, if, I, if I do this, then I, I'm deserving of death. And they're hearing these things, they're understanding them, and their emotions are just, they're just distraught because they have, they, they're realizing how, how far they really are from the Lord. But they really aren't that far away from the Lord. They're really only one breath that includes a prayer of repentance. That's, all, that's as far as they are from the Lord. That's all. Uh, but you see here that he's... Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, they, this, is, this is not a day that we're going to mourn. There'll be time for all that later. We'll get together and we'll get things right. Uh, you're already getting it right. I can see that. But today's a feast day. Go and eat what's prepared and, and, and drink what's prepared. Go and those who are over there, you know, give them a portion of it. So now verse uh, 13. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees, and make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in the courtyard or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day the children of Israel had not done so, and there was very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. So here it is. It's the seventh month. They get to this part in the law, and uh, somebody says, Hey, that's now. Why don't we do that now? And everybody else is like, Yeah, why don't we do that now? What better time to obey than now? And I love that example that they said. They hear, and they're like, Yeah, let's do that. This is what God says. Let's do it. Sometimes we don't do that, you know. Sometimes we hear. And we say, you know what, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to think about whether I ought to 
serve this year, you know, whether I ought to give. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that. When, in, in fact, what we ought to do is, in your time of study, when you hear the message of God's Word, or you're in Sunday school class, when you hear, you ought to immediately obey. That honors the Lord when you uh, omedi- immediately obey. Uh, our old pastor in, uh, at Auburn used to always say, delayed obedience is disobedience. I think that's true. If you've got a debate about it, is Jesus really Lord, you know? So what a good example we have from that. Uh, I'll just read the last three, uh, well, three more in chapter 9, and we'll, we'll finish up there. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God from one fourth of, for one fourth of the day and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped before the Lord their God so think about from the very beginning of the book what we, what we read you know the walls are torn down people aren't following the Lord and now you've got the spirit of the whole nation that's turned around I mean this is this is real revival you know and I think there's a couple of ways that they found it one God had to put in the heart of Nehemiah and the heart of Artaxerxes, and before that, you know, Esther, he had a heart for the Jewish people because, partly because of Esther. I mean, I can't imagine that that's not the case. So God's doing what he does. Um, but then, notice how much of the reading of the law there is, you know. It wasn't that just that one day. Remember during the feast, they read it for every day, and then after that it said they read for a quarter of the day, and then they, they worship. Brother Anthony was up there for a quarter of the day, leading in worship, and there are times that, that they would... They would have repentance, you know, and just demonstrate repentance. And so I can't help but think about the, the connection between our repentance and turning to the Lord and walking rightly before the Lord and hearing the word of the Lord, right? So many times we, we don't read it on our own. It's not, a, it's not something we make a commitment to. But, and there's, there's, re, there's really, I don't know, there's, that's how you stay close to the Lord is to stay in His Word. You're constantly hearing what He wants and that Spirit of God that's within you will convict you and, and, uh, and teach you and show you the right, the right way. And so, you know, I, I, I'm a little jealous. I love to see this, but I, well, I want that for my country, don't you? Don't you want your country to turn back to the Lord? Um, I, think, uh, I think it starts with prayer. We pray and we don't give up in prayer. Um, and, and then it, it starts with us. We hear His Word. And we do what we can do. And then there's those times when we have an open door. And it's one soul and one heart and one mind at a time as we, as we go out and we, we be just who we are. Not, not having to set the world on fire, not having to knock down doors, but just to be faithful and be ready and be obedient to what God has for us when, when He opens the door. So, Well, that's kind of Nehemiah in a nutshell. I wonder if you have anything you want to add to that. Anything from anybody? Speak now or wait till next time. Okay, any announcements that we need to make? I know Saturday, um, nine o'clock. You can um, you can always come early and help decorate, do things like that. But we're going to meet here at nine. We're going to eat um, breakfast and then we'll go probably probably around ten. If you've got a some kind of some kind of special vehicle, um, that'd be good to bring that. Or you can ride the hayride, either one. But we just want to. Remind our community about Bible school that's coming up. So, any other um, announcement? All right. So, if you are uh, one of those that had uh, had a VBS staff shirt, uh, it's out there, actually, right over there by the by the welcome center. You can't miss it. It's a big table. So, all right. Well, let's just encourage each other. I know uh, your know, Bible school week is is going to be. It's going to be difficult. It's tiring. There's a lot of people who are already tired. You know, they've been doing things. Um, one, one lady got up here. I was up here, and she was up here super, super early. I was like, wow, I can't believe she's up here working this hard this early. And so there's just a, a lot of things going behind the scenes. So let's just encourage each other. You see somebody doing something, give them a pat on the back, and just, just let's love on each other and encourage each other uh, this week and next, okay? Well, let's stand, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. 
Father, we're thankful for your word. And Father, I pray we would not neglect your word. I'm thankful for the, the children that are here tonight, the youth. Father, we, we're looking forward to Bible school. I pray you bring us many kids that we can share the gospel with, that we can just love on. and They'll know that, that church is a place where they can, they can find hope and people who love them. I pray for salvations this coming up week. Father, I pray for those who are working hard and might be a little stressed. I pray you'd bless them and give them what they need. Father, we pray for our, our parade, and we pray for our services Sunday. Uh, Lord, that your word might go forth. We might hear your word and obey. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We again, again, just want to thank you for the, the founding of the nation. And as we think about even our, our church uh, tonight, we, we thank you for the way our church was founded and the faithful ones. And again, Lord, would you make us faithful and just add us to that, that number. And Lord, bless us through the rest of this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, see you guys Saturday, if not before.